Stories of Loch Gear by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. When the present writer was a boy of twelve or thirteen, he first made the acquaintance of Miss Anne Bailey of Loch Gear in the county of Limerick. She and her sister were the last representatives at that place of an extremely good old name in the county. They were both what is termed old maids, and at that time past sixty. But never were old ladies more hospitable, lively and kind, especially to young people. They were both remarkably agreeable and clever. Like all old county ladies of their time, they were great genealogists and could recount the origin, generations and intermarriages of every county family of note. These ladies were visited at their house at Loch Gear by Mr. Crofton Croker and are, I think, mentioned by name in the second series of his fairy legends, the series in which, probably communicated by Miss Anne Bailey, he recounts some of the picturesque traditions of those beautiful lakes, lakes I should no longer say, for the smaller and prettier has since been drained and gave up from its depths some long-lost and very interesting relics. In their drawing room stood a curious relic of another sort, old enough too, though belonging to a much more modern period. It was the ancient stirrup cup of the hospitable house of Loch Gear. Crofton Croker has preserved a sketch of this curious glass. I have often had it in my hand. It had a short stem, and the cup part, having the bottom rounded, rose cylindrically, and being of a capacity to contain a whole bottle of claret, and almost as narrow as an old-fashioned ale glass, was tall to a degree that filled me with wonder. As it obliged the rider to extend his arm as he raised the glass, it must have tried a tipsy man, sitting in the saddle pretty severely. The wonder was that the marvellous tall glass had come down to our times without a crack. There was another glass worthy of remark in the same drawing room. It was gigantic and shaped conically like one of those old-fashioned jelly glasses which used to be seen upon the shelves of confectioners. It was engraved round the rim with the words The Glorious, Pious and Immortal Memory. And on grand occasions it was filled to the brim and after the manner of a loving cup made the circuit of the Whig guests who owed all to the hero whose memory its legend invoked. It was now but the transparent phantom of those solemn convivialities of a generation who lived, as it were, within hearing of the cannon and shouting of those stirring times. When I saw it, this glass had long retired from politics and carousals, and stood peacefully on a little table in the drawing-room, where ladies' hands replenished it with fair water and crowned it daily with flowers from the garden. Miss Anne Bailey's conversation ran oftener than her sister's upon the legendary and supernatural. She told her stories with the sympathy, the colour and the mysterious air which contribute so powerfully to effect, and never wearied of answering questions about the old castle and amusing her young audience with fascinating little glimpses of old adventure and bygone days. My memory retains the picture of my early friend very distinctly, a slim, straight figure above the middle height, a general likeness to the full-length portrait of that delightful Countess d'Aulnois, to whom we all owe our earliest and most brilliant glimpses of fairyland. Something of her gravely pleasant countenance, plain but refined and ladylike, 
with that kindly mystery in her sidelong glance and uplifted finger which indicated the approaching climax of a tale of wonder. Lock Gear is a kind of centre of the operations of the monster fairies. When a child is stolen by the good people, Loch Gear is conjectured to be the place of its unearthly transmutation from the human to the fairy state. And beneath its waters lie enchanted the grand old castle of the Desmonds, the great Earl himself, his beautiful young Countess, and all the retinue that surrounded him in the years of his splendour and at the moment of his catastrophe. Here too are historic associations. The huge square tower that rises at one side of the stable yard, close to the house, to a height that amazed my young eyes, though robbed of its battlements and one story, was a stronghold of the last rebellious Earl of Desmond, and is specially mentioned in that delightful old folio, the Hibernia Pacata, as having, with its Irish garrison on the battlements, defied the army of the Lord Deputy, then marching by upon the summits of the overhanging hills. The house, built under shelter of this stronghold, of the once proud and turbulent Desmonds, is old but snug, with a multitude of small, low rooms, such as I have seen in houses of the same age in Shropshire and the neighbouring English counties. The hills that overhang the lakes appeared to me in my young days, and I have not seen them since, to be clothed with a short, soft verdure of a hue so dark and vivid as I had never seen before. In one of the lakes is a small island, rocky and wooded, which is believed by the peasantry to represent the top of the highest tower of the castle which sank, under a spell, to the bottom. In certain states of the atmosphere, I have heard educated people say, when in a boat you have reached a certain distance, the island appears to rise some feet from the water, its rocks assume the appearance of masonry, and the whole circuit presents very much the effect of the battlements of a castle rising above the surface of the lake. This was Miss Anne Bailey's story of the submersion of this lost castle. The Magician Earl It is well known that the great Earl of Desmond though history pretends to dispose of him differently, lives to this hour enchanted in his castle, with all his household at the bottom of the lake. There was not in his day in all the world so accomplished a magician as he. His fairest castle stood upon an island in the lake, and to this he brought his young and beautiful bride whom he loved but too well, for she prevailed upon his folly to risk all to gratify her imperious caprice. They had not been long in this beautiful castle, when she one day presented herself in the chamber in which her husband studied his forbidden art, and there implored him to exhibit before her some of the wonders of his evil science. He resisted long, but her entreaties, tears and wheedlings were at length too much for him, and he consented. But before beginning those astonishing transformations with which he was about to amaze her, he explained to her the awful conditions and dangers of the experiment. Alone in his vast apartment, the walls of which were lapped far below by the lake whose dark waters lay waiting to swallow them, she must witness a certain series of frightful phenomena, which, once commenced, 
he could neither abridge nor mitigate. And if throughout their ghastly succession she spoke one word or uttered one exclamation, the castle and all that it contained would in one instant subside to the bottom of the lake, there to remain under the servitude of a strong spell for ages. The dauntless curiosity of the lady having prevailed, and the oaken door of the study being locked and barred, the fatal experiments commenced. Muttering a spell as he stood before her, feathers sprouted thickly over him, his face became contracted and hooked, a cadaverous smell filled the air, and with heavy winnowing wings, a gigantic vulture rose in his stead and swept round and round the room, as if on the point of pouncing upon her. The lady commanded herself through this trial, and instantly another began. The bird alighted near the door and in less than a minute changed, she saw not how, into a horribly deformed and dwarfish hag, who with yellow skin hanging about her face and enormous eyes, swung herself on crutches toward the lady, her mouth foaming with fury, and her grimaces and contortions becoming more and more hideous every moment, till she rolled with a yell on the floor, in a horrible convulsion at the lady's feet, and then changed into a huge serpent with crest erect and quivering tongue. Suddenly, as it seemed on the point of darting at her, she saw her husband in its stead standing pale before her, and with his finger on his lip enforcing the continued necessity of silence. He then placed himself at his length on the floor and began to stretch himself out and out, longer and longer, until his head nearly reached to one end of the vast room and his feet to the other. This horror overcame her. The ill-starred lady uttered a wild scream, whereupon the castle and all that was in it sank in a moment to the bottom of the lake. But once in every seven years by night, the Earl of Desmond and his retinue emerge and cross the lake in shadowy cavalcade. His white horse is shod with silver. On that one night, the Earl may ride till daybreak, and it behoves him to make good sense of his time, for until the silver shoes of his steed be worn through, the spell that holds him and his beneath the lake will retain its power. When I, Miss Anne Bailey, was a child, there was still living a man named Teague O'Neill who had a very strange story to tell. He was a smith and his forge stood on the brow of the hill overlooking the lake, on a lonely part of the road to Cahir Conlesh. One bright moonlit night, he was working very late and quite alone. The clink of his hammer and the wavering glow reflected through the open door on the bushes at the other side of the narrow road were the only tokens that told of life and vigil for miles around. In one of the pauses of his work, he heard the ring of many hoofs ascending the steep road that passed his forge, and standing in this doorway, he was just in time to see a gentleman on a white horse, who was dressed in a fashion the like of which the smith had never seen before. This man was accompanied and followed by a mounted retinue as strangely dressed as he they seemed by the clang and clatter that announced their approach to be riding up the hill at a hard hurry scurry gallop, but the pace abated as they drew near, 
and the rider of the white horse, who, from his grave and lordly air, he assumed to be a man of rank, and accustomed to command, drew bridle and came to a halt before the smith's door. He did not speak, and all his train were silent, but he beckoned to the smith and pointed down to one of his horse's hoofs. Teague stopped and raised it and held it just long enough to see that it was shod with a silver shoe, which in one place, he said, was worn as thin as a shilling. Instantaneously, his situation was made apparent to him by this sign, and he recoiled with a terrified prayer. The lordly rider took a look of pain and fury, struck at him suddenly with something that whistled in the air like a whip, and an icy streak steamed to traverse his body, as if he had been cut through with a leaf of steel. But he was without scathe or scar, as he afterwards found. At the same moment, he saw the whole cavalcade break into a gallop and disappear down the hill, with a momentary hurtling in the air like the flight of a volley of a cannon shot. Here had been the Earl himself. He had tried one of his accustomed stratagems to lead the smith to speak to him, for it is well known that either for the purpose of abridging or of mitigating his period of enchantment, he seeks to lead people to accost him. But what, in the event of his succeeding, would befall the person whom he had thus ensnared, no one knows. Mull Ryle's Adventure When Miss Anne Bailey was a child, Mull Ryle was an old woman. She had lived all her days with the Baileys of Loch Gear, in and about whose house, as was the Irish custom of those days, were a troop of barefooted country girls, scurry maids or laundresses, or employed about the poultry yard or running of errands. Among these was Mull Ryle, then a stout good-humoured lass, with little to think of and nothing to fret about. She was once washing clothes by the process known universally in Munster as beetling. The washer stands up to her ankles in water, in which she has immersed the clothes, which she lays in that state on a great flat stone and smacks them with lusty strokes of an instrument which bears a rude resemblance to a cricket bat, only shorter, broader and light enough, to be wielded freely with one hand. Thus they smack the dripping clothes, turning them over and over, sousing them in the water and replacing them on the same stone, to undergo a repetition of the process until they are thoroughly washed. Mole Ryle was plying her beetle at the margin of the lake, close under the old house and castle. It was between eight and nine o'clock on a fine summer morning, Everything looked bright and beautiful. Though quite alone, and though she could not even see the windows of the house, hidden from her view by the irregular ascent and some interposing bushes, her loneliness was not depressing. Standing up from her work, she saw a gentleman walking slowly down the slope towards her. He was a grand-looking gentleman, arrayed in a flowered silk dressing gown with a cap of velvet on his head, and as he stepped towards her in his slippered feet, he showed a very handsome leg. He was smiling graciously as he approached, and drawing a ring from his finger with an air of gracious meaning which seemed to imply that he wished to make her a present. He raised it in his fingers with a pleased look, and placed it on the flat stones beside the clothes she had been beetling so industriously. He drew back a little, and continued to look at her with an encouraging smile which seemed to say, You have earned your reward, 
You must not be afraid to take it. The girl fancied that this was some gentleman who had arrived, as often happened in those hospitable and haphazard times, late and unexpectedly the night before, and who was now taking a little indolent ramble before breakfast. Mole Ryle was a little shy, and more so at having been discovered by so grand a gentleman with her petticoats gathered a little high about her bare shins. She looked down, therefore, upon the water at her feet, and then she saw a ripple of blood, and then another, ring after ring, coming and going to and from her feet. She cried out the sacred name in horror, and lifting her eyes, the courtly gentleman was gone, but the blood rings about her feet spread with the speed of light over the surface of the lake, which for a moment glowed like one vast estuary of blood. Here was the Earl once again, and Mole Ryle declared that if it had not been for that frightful transformation of the water, she would have spoken to him next minute, and would thus have passed under a spell perhaps as direful as his own. The Banshee So old a monster family as the Baileys of Loch Gear could not fail to have their attendant Banshee. Everyone attached to the family knew this well, and could cite evidences of that unearthly distinction. I heard Miss Bailey relate the only experience she had personally had of that wild spiritual sympathy. She said that, then being young, she and Miss Susan undertook a long attendance upon the sick bed of their sister, Miss Kitty, whom I have heard remembered among her contemporaries as the merriest and most entertaining of human beings. This light-hearted young lady was dying of consumption. The sad duties of such attendants being divided among many sisters as there then were, the night watches devolved upon the two ladies I have named, I think as being the eldest. It is not improbable that these long and melancholy vigils, lowering the spirits and exciting their nervous system, prepared them for illusions. At all events, one night, at dead of night, Miss Bailey and her sister, sitting in the dying lady's room, heard such sweet and melancholy music as they had never heard before. It seemed to them like distant cathedral music. The room of the dying girl had its windows toward the yard, and the old castle stood near and in full sight. The music was not in the house, but seemed to come from the yard, or beyond it. Miss Anne Bailey took a candle and went down the back stairs. She opened the back door and, standing there, heard the same faint but solemn harmony, and could not tell whether it most resembled the distant music of instruments, or a choir of voices. It seemed to come through the windows of the old castle, high in the air, but when she approached the tower, the music, she thought, came from above the house, at the other side of the yard, and thus perplexed and at last frightened, she returned. This aerial music both she and her sister, Miss Susan Bailey, avowed that they distinctly heard, and for a long time. Of the fact she was clear, and she spoke of it with great awe. The Governess's Dream this lady, one morning, with a grave countenance that indicated something weighty upon her mind, told her pupils that she had, on the night before, had a very remarkable dream. 
The first room you enter in the old castle, having reached the foot of the spiral stone stair, is a large hall, dim and lofty, having only a small window or two, set high in deep recesses in the wall. When I saw the castle many years ago, a portion of this capacious chamber was used as a store for the turf laid in to last the year. Her dream placed her alone in this room, and there entered a grave-looking man, having something very remarkable about his countenance, which impressed her as a fine portrait sometimes will, with a haunting sense of character and individuality. In his hand, the man carried a wand, about the length of an ordinary walking cane. He told her to observe and remember its length, and to mark well the measurements he was about to make, the result of which she was to communicate to Mr. Bailey of Loch Gear. From a certain point in the wall, with this wand he measured along the floor, at right angles to the wall, a certain number of its lengths, which he counted aloud, and then, in the same way, from the adjoining wall, he measured a certain number of its lengths, which he also counted distinctly. He then told her that at the point where these two lines met, at a depth of a certain number of feet which he also told her, treasure lay buried. And so the dream broke up, and her remarkable visitant vanished. She took the girls with her to the old castle, where, having cut a switch to the length represented to her in her dream, she measured the distances and ascertained, as she supposed, the point on the floor beneath which the treasure lay. The same day she related her dream to Mr. Bailey, but he treated it laughingly and took no step in consequence. Some time after this, she again saw, in a dream, the same remarkable-looking man, who repeated his message, and appeared displeased. But the dream was treated by Mr. Bailey, as before. The same dream occurred again, and the children became so clamorous to have the castle floor explored with pick and shovel at the point indicated by the thrice-seen messenger, that at length Mr. Bailey consented, and the floor was opened, and a trench was sunk at the spot which the governess had pointed out. Miss Anne Bailey and nearly all the members of the family, her father included, were present at this operation. As the workmen approached the depth described in the vision, the interest and suspense of all increased, and when the iron implements met the solid resistance of a broad flagstone, which returned a cavernous sound to the stroke, the excitement of all present rose to its acme. With some difficulty the flag was raised, and a chamber of stonework large enough to receive a moderately sized crock or pit was disclosed. Alas, it was empty. But in the earth at the bottom of it, Miss Bailey said, she herself saw, as every other bystander plainly did, the circular impression of a vessel which had stood there, as the mark seemed to indicate, for a very long time. Both the Miss Baileys were strong in their belief here afterwards that the treasure which they were convinced had actually been deposited there had been removed by some more trusting and active listener than their father had proved. This same governess remained with them to the time of her death, which occurred some years later, under the following circumstances as extraordinary as her dream. The Earl's Hall the good governess had a particular liking for the old castle, and when lessons were over, would take her book or her work into a large room in the ancient building called the Earl's Hall. 
Here she caused the table and chair to be placed for her use, and in the chiaroscuro would so sit at her favourite occupations, with just a little ray of subdued light admitted through one of the glassless windows above her, and falling upon her table. The Earl's Hall is entered by a narrow arched door, opening close to the winding stair. It is a very large and gloomy room, pretty nearly square, with a lofty vaulted ceiling and a stone floor. Being situated high in the castle, the walls of which are immensely thick, and the windows very small and few, the silence that reigns here is like that of a subterranean cavern. You can hear nothing in this solitude, except perhaps twice in a day the twitter of a swallow in one of the small windows high in the wall. This good lady, having one day retired to her accustomed solitude, was missed from the house at her wanted hour of return. This, in a country house such as Irish houses were in those days, excited little surprise and no harm. But when the dinner hour came, which was then in country houses five o'clock, and the governess had not appeared, some of her young friends, it being not yet winter, and sufficient light remaining to guide them through the gloom of the dim ascent and passages, mounted the old stone stair to the level of the Earl's Hall, gaily calling to her as they approached. There was no answer. On the stone floor outside the door of the Earl's Hall, to their horror, they found her lying insensible. By the usual means she was restored to consciousness, but she continued very ill and was conveyed to the house where she took to her bed. It was there and then that she related what had occurred to her. She had placed herself, as usual, at her little work table, and had been either working or reading, I forget which, for some time, and felt in her usual health and serene spirits. Raising her eyes and looking towards the door, she saw a horrible-looking little man enter. He was dressed in red, was very short, and had a singularly dark face and a most atrocious countenance. Having walked some steps into the room with his eyes fixed on her, he stopped, and beckoning her to follow, moved back toward the door. About halfway again he stopped once more and turned. She was so terrified that she sat staring at the apparition without moving or speaking. Seeing that she had not obeyed him, his face became more frightful and menacing, and as it underwent this change, he raised his hand and stamped on the floor. Gesture, look, and all expressed diabolical fury. Through sheer extremity of terror, she did rise, and as he turned again, followed him a step or two in the direction of the door. He again stopped, and with the same mute menace, compelled her again to follow him. She reached the narrow stone doorway of the Earl's Hall through which he had passed. From the threshold she saw him standing a little way off, with his eyes still fixed on her. Again he signed to her and began to move along the short passage that leads to the winding stair. But instead of following him further, she fell on the floor in a fit. The poor lady was thoroughly persuaded that she was not long to survive this vision, and her foreboding proved true. From her bed she never rose. Fever and delirium supervened in a few days, and she died. Of course, it is possible that fever already approaching 
had touched her brain when she was visited by the phantom, and that it had no external existence. 